Hello. This lesson begins a new unit on rational functions. Just a reminder, a rational number is any number that can be expressed as a fraction where the top and bottom are both integer values. And a rational function is going to be any, any function that we can represent as a fraction where the top and bottom are both polynomials. And we're going to start off today with the easiest possible example of that, which is called a reciprocal of a linear function. So basically one over mx plus b, something pretty str simple and straightforward. Uh, I believe we're going to actually use the variable a instead of m, but same idea. Let's take a look at the lesson and see where we go from there. Okay, so we're going to start off by doing the simplest of the simplest possible uh, rational functions, and that's going to be f at x equals 1 over x. Now, when I say we're starting with this, really, uh, I don't think that's a big deal since we've done it in grade 11, and you're pretty familiar with this function. So let's start off by taking a look at what the graph looks like for just f at x equals 1 over x. I'm going to graph it by hand, and I'm going to do it by, in my head at least, thinking about some points of uh, reference or some coordinates. Uh, when I plug in 1 for x, I get y equals 1, or f at x equals 1. So I'll plot that point. When I plug in 2, I get a half, 3, I get a third, 4, I get a quarter, and so on. Now, if I plug in fractions uh, greater than 1, if I plug in x equals a half, I get 2 x equals a third, I get three, x equals four, I get a quarter, and so on. And so I end up getting a graph that looks a little bit like this, which again, I'm sure you all remember, and that should be nice and smooth there, despite the fact that I didn't draw it that way. Uh, similarly, we get the same thing happening for negative values, and we end up getting a line that looks like this. And just a reminder, this has two asymptotes. We have x equals 0 is a vertical asymptote. And then we have another one there, a horizontal one. And that's y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. And even as I write that, I realize it's going to get in the way of something I need to write in just a moment. So I'm going to cheat and move it over a little bit, but it's still valid. Okay. So now something that's pretty similar to the notation we used uh, last unit or the unit before for n behavior is that uh, we can say as x goes to negative infinity or positive infinity, what happens to y, or in this case, f at x. So as it goes to negative infinity, f at x doesn't go to positive or negative infinity, it actually goes to zero. So this is where n behavior by quadrant doesn't really make a lot of sense, because it's not just going into quadrant three, it is technically going to small negative numbers, but it is approaching zero. And as x approaches positive infinity, f at x is also approaching zero. Now there's some slightly new notation here that we could talk about as we reach our, uh, or approach our vertical asymptote. And this is something we always said in words, we just didn't write it symbolically. But as uh, x goes to, now you'll notice it's zero with the exponent, or it looks like the exponent of a, a minus sign or a negative sign. And really what that, that means is as x approaches zero from the negative side. So as we're, as we're approaching it from this side, what's happening to f at x? And the answer is it's going down to negative infinity. And then the next one is what happens to x as we approach from the positive side. So we're coming towards zero, but we're coming from the positive side towards zero, and it seems to be going up to positive infinity. So very similar notation to our end behavior. Just now we're using it in a slightly different way to not just describe what happens as we go to positive and negative infinity, but what happens as we approach the vertical asymptotes. All right. Let's take a look at f at x equals 1 over 3x. All we've done is add in a 3 here. The question is, what's that going to do to our graph? 
Now we can think of this much like we thought of any transformation of graphs because it is actually a transformation of the graph. Or we can plug in points and see what happens. Um, what I'm going to do is just kind of plug in a couple points and see if it makes sense and then we'll go from there. So if I plug in x equals 1, I'm going to get 1 third for y. And if I plug in uh, x equals 2, I get 1 sixth. 1 third, I get 1 ninth. And if I want to get uh, y equal to 1, I have to plug in x equals a third. So something around there. And I think you're going to see that it still does the same thing at x equals 0. It becomes undefined. So our graph's going to look something like... I want to be careful when I'm doing this. And the reason I want to be careful is because I don't want it to make it look like it's coming back up again. I definitely want it to keep getting closer and closer to the axis, although that's very hard to do after a certain point, uh, because I want to be clear that there is an asymptote there, a horizontal asymptote. And same thing over here. Uh, if we want our y value to be 1, we have to plug in x equals negative a third. Or sorry, if we want our y value to be negative 1. Uh, and so we do this. And I realize that this looks almost identical to y equals 1 over x. And that's because it hasn't changed much. Just a reminder that when we plug in... Uh, a 3 in front of the x, that's actually a k-value transformation, and that squeezes the, the graph horizontally. So it squeezes in from the left and the right. So points that were here have now been squished over to one-third their original value. So that's all we've done to the graph 1 over x is, is basically compress it side to side. Uh, let's just take a look at what the domain range and all that other cool stuff are. Uh, the domain of this, I'm going to write these using uh, inequality formation. Uh, we have x is the element of real. And x can be anything except 0. Now we can see that because there is a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, but logically the reason it can't be 0 is because when we plug that into f at x, we get 1 over 3 times 0, which is 1 over 0, which is technically undefined. And really domain is what values of x can I put in that don't break the function? x equals 0 breaks the function, so I can't plug it in. Now range is all the possible y values. Now, it's impossible to get a y value that breaks the function because there isn't one. Um, but we can say what values of y can we never, ever get no matter what x we plug in. And in this case, it's impossible to get y equals 0 because 1 over anything will never equal 0. So basically, y can't be 0, but we already knew that because there's a horizontal asymptote and it doesn't get crossed. I will say that horizontal asymptotes can get crossed, but this one is not getting crossed. So the asymptotes, we kind of already said this, but our vertical asymptote is x equals 0, and our horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. Now what about end behavior? We've already done this one sort of for the one above, but we'll just say as x approaches negative infinity, y approaches 0. And as x approaches positive infinity, y approaches 0. Now, if we want to be super technical, and, and we don't have to be here, I won't detect marks or anything if you don't do it, but I can say that x as x approaches um, negative infinity, y approaches 0, and I put the little negative up there to say that it approaches 0 from the negative side, which means it's getting really, really close to the 0, but technically it's still a negative number. And likewise, for positive infinity, it is approaching 0, but it's approaching from the positive side. It is actually always going to be positive.
It might be 0 0.000 millions of zeros and then a 1, but it's still actually a positive number. How about the function f at x equals negative 1 over x plus 3? Well, let's think about this as a transformation. The negative sign in front is just a vertical flip. It flips things top to bottom. And the plus 3 at the bottom is just a uh, shift of 3 to the left. Uh, sorry, 3 to the yeah left x plus 3 is 3 left. So that means that our graph, and I'm going to actually put the asymptotes in because it's easier to draw this way. There would have been an asymptote at uh, x equals 0, a vertical asymptote. It is now going to be shifted over 3 to the left. And our horizontal asymptote is still going to be y equals 0. And now it just becomes a little bit easier to draw. I will point out that uh, normally we would have it looking like this. I'm doing this in a light color because I don't want it to be the focus of what we look at. But because we're doing a vertical flip, top goes to bottom and bottom goes to top. And so the blue line is our f at x. We've applied the vertical flip. It's been shifted three to the left. We're good to go. All right, now to fill in some blanks. Domain, x is the element of real such that x is not equal to negative three. Because again, that would break the function. It would give us a negative, or sorry, give us a zero on the bottom. Range. Y is all real numbers, except that Y cannot ever be zero. Same logic as the last one. Asymptotes. We want to look at X as it goes to negative infinity and X as it goes to positive infinity. As it goes to negative infinity, Y approaches zero. Technically from the negative, or sorry, from the positive side in this case, because it's now above the axis right there. And as it goes to positive infinity, it approaches zero from the negative side. So yeah, uh, I will point out, I don't, I don't even know if the textbook or the, uh, the answer sheets use the plus or minus. If they do, fantastic. If not, saying y goes to zero is actually enough. I'm just putting that in to remind us where it's going to zero as. And this, this kind of matters if we go into more complex things and we just want to know if the answer is going to be positive or negative. Um, so that just kind of reminds us. Oh, what did I just do? I just did end behavior. And I get to take advantage of my tool again. I move that down here. There is our end behavior. And our asymptotes are uh, vertical x equals negative 3 and horizontal y equals 0. Sorry about that. The next one we're going to look at and, um, oh, I actually meant to change this. I'll fix this on your handout. Let's actually do the, uh, the function that's above. Let's look at y equals negative 1 over x plus 3. And we'll, we'll change the top to an a and see what the a does. We'll see if that has much of an effect at all. So I'm going to pause for a second, go over to Desmos. OK, and I'm going to plug in my original function, f at x or y equals 1 over x, uh, sorry, negative negative 1 over x plus 3. We'd also verify that it does what we thought it was going to do, and it appears to. Um, I'm actually just for interest sake going to plug in the two asymptotes. So the vertical asymptote we said was x equals negative 3, and the horizontal was y equals 0.
so they're both visible there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the top of this to an A instead of being just a 1. And let's see what happens to this whole graph as A increases. And I'm actually going to just think of positive values of A. A negative we know is going to uh, flip it. But positive values of A, okay, they don't change the asymptotes at all. It just seems to make it a little bit fatter or thinner. And if you think about what A did in the first place back when we talked about transformations, A is technically actually doing a vertical stretch. It's really almost impossible with this graph, in fact, it is impossible with this graph, to distinguish the difference between a vertical stretch and a horizontal compression, but A is a vertical stretch. Okay, now that we've looked at that, let's go back to the lesson. We're just going to make a mental note of what that did. And let's take a look at another function. f at x equals uh, 1 over 2x minus 3. By the way, this is about as complex as these possible or these types of ones can get. It's it's reciprocal of a linear function. The linear function, we have a slope, we have a y-intercept. I mean, that's we could change the numbers, but that's about it. Um, I'm going to ask you to think about what that graph would look like just before we actually get into the graph. And I'm going to actually uh, see if we can figure out what the domain range uh, asymptotes and all that stuff should be, maybe a little bit before. At least let's look at the asymptotes. First of all, is our asymptote for our ver uh, horizontal going to be any different than it was before? So we have our vertical, which is x equals something, and we have our horizontal, which is y equals something. I think our horizontal asymptote is going to stay exactly the same. Uh, what about our vertical asymptote? Now, there's probably a bunch of people that want to say that x equals 3 is the vertical asymptote, but we have to be careful here. Because remember, that's not actually in normal uh, form for a transformation. I'm going to rewrite it this way. 2x minus something. What would the something be in the bracket? Because we've got the 2 in front, which is technically a... Uh, horizontal compression and then we've got a number there that's going to slide us left or right but when we factor a two out of there we're actually left with three halves not three or negative three halves not negative three so our vertical asymptotes actually going to be x equals three halves not x equals three uh, because of that our domain should be x is the element of real such that x is not equal to three halves which makes sense because going back to our modified equation or the original equation if x was three halves we'd have one over zero and for y y is the element of real such that y is not equal to zero because that is our horizontal asymptote End behavior, I'm going to predict, because we're not expecting any flip vertically, that as x goes to negative infinity, y will go to 0 from the negative side. And as x goes to positive infinity, y goes to 0 from the positive side. So again, I'm going to start. I, I find it always easier to draw my asymptotes on our graph for uh, a reciprocal function like this, rather than start the graph. and put them in later just as it's an easier target to go on so we've got that and we've got a asymptote at x equals three halves so here and now we can start thinking about points uh, normally we'd have um, a point about here if we didn't have a compression we'd have a point about there because as we go one to the right, we go uh, up one. Or as we go up one, we go one to the right. But we have a horizontal compression, so it's actually going to be right there. And it's going to be 
basically just our regular 1 over x, but squished a little bit. And I think that's accurate enough to do by hand. And likewise, this one's compressed. Oops, sorry. In the completely wrong spot there. I should go over to our fake axes, the red ones, and say it would normally go over one, but now it's only going to go over a half. And so I'm going to go over to Desmos and just make sure that I did this correctly. Uh, I'm going to just point out that the coordinates of the two points that I kind of focused on, uh, this point would be 2, 1, and this point would be 1, negative 1. And we'll see if we actually get those on our graph. Oops. Come back, Desmos. Where did you go? Oh, there we are. Okay. So if we, again, take a look over here, I'm going to get rid of all this extra stuff. And we want to look at 2x minus 3. Uh, there we are. We said we'd have an asymptote at x equals 3 halves. And we do. I'm just going to change the color on it because I don't like the asymptote to be the same color as the graph. And we should have a horizontal at y equals 0. Okay, that checks out. Now, do we have our point 2, 1 there? We do. And do we have our point negative 1, our 1, negative 1? And the answer is yes, we do. So I think we drew our graph correctly. So just treating this like any other transformation, Uh, I'm actually going to just show you that this graph is the exact same as if I factor the 2 on the bottom. There we go. Um, if we look down here for our transformations, we have a horizontal compression of factor of 2, and we're sliding it uh, 3 halves to the right. Okay. One more little thing to talk about today, and that's rate of change, which is not new to us. So let's see if we can use our rate of change idea that we've done before. We did it with polynomial equations uh, to figure out what the slope or the rate of change will be for this graph, f at x equals 1 over 2x minus 3 at x equals 2. And just a reminder, what we're going to actually do is find a secant between the point at x equals 2 and whatever its y value is, which we'll figure out in a second, and a point that's just a little wee bit beyond it. So I'm going to actually say, uh, let's plug in slope of the secant is f at 2 minus f at, let's say, 2.01. That's pretty close. Over 2 minus 2.01. Uh, by the way, uh, you could actually do these backwards, um, f at 2.01 minus f at 2, and then reverse the bottom. It just multiplies top and bottom by a negative. It doesn't make any difference. Either way, we've got two core, or two points, and we're looking at them. Uh, actually, you know what? Just to be proper, we should do it the way we normally would. I want to demonstrate good form when I can. This is going to be f at x plus a little bit, so in this case, 2.01 minus f at x over x2 minus x1. Okay, so if I plug the numbers in for this, uh, I've got to plug 2.01 into the equation, 1 over 2x minus 3. So 2 times 2.01 minus 3 and then 1 over that. I'm getting 0 0.9804, I think is probably enough decimal places to, to keep us decent. And when I plug in 2 there, I get 4 minus 3 is 1 over 1, so it's just 1. Okay. When I... Uh, 
one second. Oh, the 0 0.9804 is actually the one second. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. I'm thinking this should be a positive answer, but it should be a negative answer. At least I think it should be a negative answer. And on the bottom, we've got 0 0.01. And now when I plug that into my calculator, I'm getting out negative 1.96. So what that means is I think the slope at x equals 2 is approximately negative 2. It's in that ballpark. I think that's pretty accurate. And if we look at our graph, at 2, I don't know, slope looks kind of like that. I don't know if that's quite negative 2. But then again, I might be off by a little. You know what? I think I am. So let's go over to Desmos again. And see what the slope is. Now, I'm looking at the point uh, 2, 1 will be on the graph. Again, I'm going to modify my equation here just a little bit. I guess we can call that m. x minus 2 plus 1. Okay, so yeah, we definitely have a line now going through that point at x equals 2. And we want to try and match that slope. And, oh, look over here. When we do that, we get it slope equals negative 2. So using Desmos, I think we've approximated it pretty well. Uh, so yeah, I think I think we can safely say that the slope is around negative 2, regardless if that's the exact value or not. Okay, so what I want to show you there is that finding the rate of change or using the secant method is the same regardless of the type of function you've got. We've done it for polynomial functions, but it's going to work for... Uh, reciprocal functions, and it's also going to work for pretty much any other kind of function we have.